Did I ever tell you the time uh, I started working in a lumber camp the first time? I was about uh, 19 years old and uh, I went to this lumber camp up north. So, you know, I enter the camp and I see some guy, I say to him, excuse me, I'm looking for the foreman, yeah? So, are oh, you looking for Tim? It's Mr. Burr, he's over there. He point over to some, some people, I don't know, so, you know, I, I walk over and I say, excuse me, I'm uh, looking for Tim Burr. The guy look at me, he say, ah, it's over there. He point over to some logs or something, you know. I walk over there, I look, I see nobody. Just the, the cut trees, they're lying there on the, you know, nobody there. I go back, I say, I, nobody, I don't see. And the guy say to me, you're looking for Tim Burr, right? I say, yeah, that's right, I'm looking for Tim Burr. He's over there. Yeah, that's when I realized they're having some fun with me, you know. <laughs> Yeah, trying to pull something over my eyes. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. This is Peter Sko for Music is a Journey. Today, I'm going to start part one of a three-part series on the Canadian hard rock and heavy metal scene. Now, I actually have been planning to do this for quite some time. The little introductory skit thing that you saw, I recorded that back in the fall of 2018. So I've had this on the plate for a while and I've just been eager to get started on it. Okay, well, of course, being from Canada, I am, I, I try to follow a lot of, of Canadian acts and especially uh, ones from the 70s because that's kind of my favorite era, but I do pick up a lot, a lot of modern stuff as well. Anyway, Today, the first part of this episode is going to focus on the 1970s hard rock scene in Canada. Okay, now before we get started on that, I want to give you a bit of background information. Um, prior to 1971, Canadian musicians actually had a pretty difficult time trying to get known in Canada. And the reason for this was Canadian music wasn't really regarded very highly at home. Uh, specifically by radio stations and unless the band had a hit single in Canada or in Britain domestic stations were not really interested so this made it a big hurdle for bands to try to get popular in their home country one of the big acts to come out of the 1960s was the Guess Who. Of course, we had Paul Anka back in the late 50s there. We had some other popular acts during the 60s, but probably one, as far as a rock band goes, one of the first big acts to show up internationally was the Guess Who. Uh, basically from 68, 69, 1970, the first three albums, Wheatful Soul, Canned Wheat, and American Woman, those albums just really shot them up in the charts um, across the border. So by 1970, it was getting to be a, a concern or an issue. People noticed, hey, we've got all these domestic acts and they're having a very hard time finding support at home. So something um, came up in 1971. They came up with the Canadian content requirements. And I'm just going to read it off Wikipedia here. I'm not going to read the whole thing. You can check it out yourself if you're really curious. Canadian content, you can read about it on Wikipedia. But what it says here is Canadian content, abbreviated to CanCon, uh, or uh, Contenu Canadien in French, uh, refers to the Canadian Radio, Television, and Telecommunications Commission, CRTC, requirements derived from the Broadcasting Act of Canada that radio and television broadcasters, including cable and satellite, uh, must air a certain percentage of content that was at least partly written, produced, presented, or otherwise contributed to by persons from Canada. Um, now, in the beginning, when this uh, was established, this was 1971, it was 25%. This was later on increased to 30% in the 1980s. By 1999, it was set at 35%. And for any new broadcasters coming out, basically it's set at 40%. So it meant that, anyway, radio and television and so on, they had to include at least 25% Canadian content. Now, um, 
to break that down a little bit more, they have, I'm going to read this here. All right, so um, it's something called the, I guess it's Maple system, but it's M-A-P-L, no E, but very conveniently, Maple. So it's easy to remember if you're from Canada. And to qualify as Canadian content, a musical selection, talk about music here, must generally fulfill at least two of the following conditions. M, music. The music is composed entirely by a Canadian. A, artist. The music is, or the lyrics are, performed principally by a Canadian. P, performance. The musical selection consists of a performance that is wholly recorded in Canada or performed wholly in Canada and broadcast live in Canada. L, lyrics. The lyrics are written entirely by a Canadian. And it goes on to explain where there are some... Um, what do you call here, uh, special cases and so on. But anyway, that is about Canadian content. Now, one other very important thing that also came up in 1971 was the Juno Awards. In the 1960s, um, a magazine, RPM Magazine, they had a reader's poll, who are your favorite Canadian artists? Who do you think are the best artists? And it was an idea to put together an official ceremony, like the Grammy Awards in the US. And um, they came out with one in 1970, and then they asked the readers to come up with a new name. And so the name Juno actually comes from the French name Juno. Um, you can read about the Juno Awards on Wikipedia. I'm not going to look at the phone again now. But anyway, it was a, a person who was instrumental in establishing the Canadian content requirements. And so they named the award after him and then just shortened it to Juno. So the Juno Awards... The first ceremony was held in 1971. So with um, radio and television being required to actually have Canadian airplay time um, for all the uh, requirements that I mentioned earlier, and as well having an award ceremony to recognize Canadian talent, this really helped the Canadian music scene in the 1970s. But it didn't go without hitches because at first it wasn't stipulated when Canadian music had to be played. So a lot of radio stations would have their Canadian music special time late at night or early in the morning, outside of the peak hours anyway. And these kind of became known as, a, a, what was it, a beaver, beaver times or something, or the beaver hour or something, because, okay, for this hour between 4.30 a.m. and 5.30 a.m., we're going to play only Canadian artists and then leave the prime time for all the big hits from Britain and the U.S., so, yeah, uh, it got a little bit off to a rocky start. And actually, a funny thing, um, you know, SCTV, the uh, Second City Television, that which started the careers of the likes of uh, John Candy and Rick Moranis, Joe Flaherty, um, Catherine O'Hara, and so on. Um, when they were doing their uh, original programs, uh, sketch comedy and so on, uh, they th they thought about this Canadian content. And so Rick Moranis and Dave Thomas, two of the, the comedians, they thought, well, what do they want us to do? Like put on toques and have Molson Canadian beer and, and sit around in, in Mac jackets. And and, and uh, based on that, they created the characters of Bob and Doug McKenzie, who were probably the most, um, became the most famous characters out of all the ones coming off SCTV until later on Martin Short joined and then he came out with his, um, what was his name now? Ed Grimley. <laughs> but anyway, Bob and Doug McKenzie, originally inspired by the whole Canadian content thing. Okay, so that's enough background information. So we hit the 1970s and now Canadian acts have a lot more freedom to get themselves known at home. Now, there's one thing you got to know. It is actually very difficult for Canadian bands, even when they are known at home, to get known overseas. The U.S. is usually uh, very big on promoting its own bands, and Britain just has so many as well. And often was the case was that Canadian bands would get picked up locally, like local areas overseas. For example, in the later 70s, uh, Saga got more noticed in Germany and Puerto Rico than anywhere else. And there was also a radio station in uh, San Antonio in Texas. They actually were promoting hard rock bands. And so a lot of Canadian bands actually got picked up by them. Uh, Triumph, Moxie, and uh, a few others. 
But anyway, now that I've given you some of the background information, let's get on to take a look at the hard rock scene. Um, specifically, I'm going to be looking for bands that do fit the mold of hard rock. Now, there are some prog bands who are kind of crossover. They've got some heavy stuff and also some more progressive stuff. But because if the main focus of most of their songs includes heavy guitars and so on, I'm going to keep them into this uh, group here. Bands like the Guess Who, they had some songs that were pretty intense and, and so on, but basically the Guess Who I don't consider a hard rock band. And there are a few other ones too, like Max Webster, they're often considered prog, but some songs are a bit heavy too, and eh, but they're not really a um, what I would call a hard rock band, like that's the basis of their music. So um, Guess Who and them. And of course Rush, everybody's uh, probably the most well-known hard rock, um, sometimes heavy metal, uh, progressive rock, um, godfathers of progressive metal, some would say even. Um, yeah, I got the video up there, I got the shirt on here. I don't think I need to cover them because they're pretty fair, fairly well known. So, how long have I been talking? I don't have a watch. Let's get on with this here. Okay, I'm just going to mention these guys here briefly, briefly at the start. Uh, Backman Turner Overdrive. Uh, Randy Backman, of course, originally with the Guess Who, left them in the early 70s and went off to start his own thing. And uh, eventually, this band is actually very important for Canadian music because while the Guess Who are said to be the first Canadian rock band to really make it big in the US, back when Turner Overdrive were the first Canadian rock band to actually make it really big internationally. And that one song of theirs, You Ain't Seen Nothing Yet, um, I think it, it I think it charted up to number one in several countries or like in the top 10 in several countries, including over in Europe as well. So that's pretty cool. Their style is a lot of it. It's, it's basically guitar rock with a lot of the songs being on the heavier side. And one song in particular on here, um, Not Fragile from, I think it's their 1973 or 1974 album of the same name. Um, it is, it's quite heavy and it's just got this this riff like and distorted guitar and so on and even in the lyrics they say you ask if we play heavy music well a thunderhead is just another cloud <laughs> pretty cool um i think they also did a lot of other things like more bluesy stuff or a little bit more almost like southern hard rock in a way at times but uh Backman Turner Overdrive are an important band in the 1970s for Canadian rock, hard rock music. So I just have this one compilation, but I thought I would start off by mentioning them. Now, let's go back to 1970. It's a band here called War Pig. They formed in 1968. In 1969, they wrote a song called Rockstar, and they recorded it on their first album here in 1970. This album is basically, yeah, 1970s heavy metal, which means, yeah, there are some distorted guitar tracks. Some are not distorted, a little more technical. It's kind of borders on prog sometimes. Some songs also feature Hammond organ. Um, some of the lyrics are, well, quite typical of the more kind of lighter side of heavy music from the day, and some of them on the more serious side of heavy music from the day. Now, I mentioned the song Rockstar because uh, you can listen to it on YouTube out there. If you listen to it, it's quite similar, I think, and many people say so, to Deep Purple's Fireball, except they wrote the song in 1969 and it came out in 1970. Deep Purple's Fireball is from 1971. Now, how did that happen? Um, Deep Purple, of course, have been known to create songs based on things they've heard before. There's actually quite a list of things out there. <coughs> Excuse me. But anyway, the one suggestion I read about was one time Deep Purple were performing in Ontario. I think it was actually in Toronto. And um, they had some trouble with some equipment. They needed some electrical engineering work. And John Lord asked if anyone in the audience would help them out. And the person who did, I think, was the road manager or someone working for War Pig anyway. So um, there's that. And that could mean also that, like, Richie Blackmore, I know... He and the other guys used to like to go around and check local acts just to see what was going on. So it's possible that they heard War Pig play, heard that song, had that going around in their head somewhere. I'm not going to say it was a direct ripoff, um, but it's possible they had that idea and it just kind of came up and yeah, that works. 
Let's go with that, you know. Um, anyway, so that's War Pig, one album in 1970, that's it. But it has been reissued. This is not the original cover, but uh, here it is. And I, it's a pretty cool album. I quite like it. Okay, another band I mentioned not that long ago anyway in the video I, I made about really heavy riffs. Uh, this is a band called Dionysus out of Quebec. They actually became quite um, a proper prog band for about three albums in the early half of the 70s. But their very first album, uh, Le Grand Jeu, in 1970 or 71, not really sure. They formed in 69, it says. They were in a jazz festival in 71. Somewhere around during that time, they recorded this album. This is a heavy psychedelic album. So yeah, it does go into prog territory. They have one song that's 11 minutes long on here, but basically the guitar is bluesy and it's heavy. And as I mentioned in that other video, the final track, uh, Agneau de Dieu, <laughs> my French pronunciation is off. Um, it just really gets into like early doom metal in the last two minutes. It's great. So I did actually play a short sample of it in that other video. So Dionysus. Okay, another band out of Quebec. This one, sex. <laughs> So they had two albums, here they are. The first one self-titled, the second one The End of My Life. The End of My Life is a conceptual album and it's a little bit more proggy. The first one here, this is 1971, so it's following that early heavy rock, uh, early 70s heavy rock style. Lot of, you know, bombastic riffs, lots of uh, lead soloing and so on. My favorite track from there is just called Not Yet. Um, bit of a jazzy feel sometimes too in there but uh, basically yeah the this first album self-titled album is quite a rocking album certainly indicative of the times in 1971 and uh, heavy rock from that time oh i forgot to check this one here now i think this one is 72 this is a band called jackal and their one and only album awake this shows up both in progressive rock and uh, proto metal so it's again it's kind of like uriah heap where they have that progressive side they have the organ they have the more complex compositions but they also have the harder heavier guitars too um so that's jackal and awake and yeah basically you could probably consider them like um not a canadian copy of uriah heap but a canadian band following that style anyway with heavy guitars and organ and more complex uh maybe esoteric pieces, I don't know. Anyway, that's Jackal. Okay, this the, the rest of this stack here is all devoted to one band. And this was actually probably um, one of the most important bands in the rock and hard rock scene in Canada in the 1970s. And I'm talking about April Wine. Now they formed in um, Nova Scotia in 1969. And then around 1970, they moved off to Montreal. It was two brothers and a cousin <laughs> and Miles Goodwin. The, the Hanneman brothers and their cousin and Miles Goodwin, anyway. And this is their debut album. I think it's 1972 or was it 71? Nope. Okay, it's 72 or 71. I forget now, sorry, but around that time. This is an interesting album because if you know April Wine's music, this is quite different. It's more of, um, there's a lot of the kind of uh, psychedelic feel to it left over from the late 60s, probably their early material, which they no doubt wrote in 69, 1970. Um, but there is that harder edge guitar coming in here and there. There's one solo, I think it's in a song called Page Five. It has a real kind of Jimmy Page feel to it. But anyway, that is not the main focus. Um, by their second album, I think the cousin had left. And uh, this is now getting into the more blues rock, hard blues rock, and uh, a couple of songs in here even have a little bit more heaviness to them, similar to Bachman Turner, Bachman Turner Overdrive's Not Fragile. Um, geez, the print on here is so tiny. If I haven't memorized all the songs, which I haven't listened to April Wine so much in the last two years or so. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm just telling you now, the second album is getting more into that April Wine sound, if you know it. And their third album, this one here, Electric Jewels, this is my favorite one. Um, by now, the, the Henneman family are out and they've got a whole new lineup of people in. I apologize, I do not remember everybody's names. I was into this band a few years ago. Um, 
this album is really great. It is a good, solid, hard-rocking album. And the opening track, um, Weeping Widow, is just fantastic. There was even an article I found on the internet about the guitar sound they use. Like, how did you get that guitar sound? Because it is so kick-ass. And I think we're talking about 1973 by now. So yeah, it must be 71, the first album then. Yeah, Electric Jewels. If you can find this one, even just listen to it on the internet or wherever, if you can find it, it's, it's awesome. Now, the album that really brought them, uh, made them big was this one here. The fourth one, Stand Back. Um, Ooh, What a Night, Come Here the Band. Um, wouldn't want your love any other way? No, tonight is a wonderful time to fall in love. I wouldn't want to lose your love, that's it. This is basically a hard rocking album with some more melodic songs in here. Tonight is a wonderful time to fall in love is the song that made me want to buy this. It's a nice melodic rock song, but there are some pretty good hard rockers in here as well. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Whole World's Gone Crazy. This one here. Now, the, I forget the guy's name, but the guy who was doing really well on these albums two to four, he left. And uh, this one here, it still is a rocking album, but I just haven't gotten into it as much. And then they did this one here. It was a Forever For Now. Actually, Miles Goodwin wanted to record a solo album. But the band was doing really well at this time, so the record label said, uh-uh, it's not going to be a solo album. It's going to be an April Wine album. So it is almost not an April Wine album. There are just maybe two songs on here, possibly three, that sound like April Wine, and the rest are Miles Goodwin solo album material stuff. I only have it because I, I thought I should listen to it. Uh, and then by the end, the latter half of the 70s, this one here, First Glance, this is a solid, hard-rocking album. Um, what is it? The Hot on the Wheels of Love is fantastic. Roller was the song that came off of this that was big. It's just a good, solid, hard-rock album. The American cover actually has a picture of the band. Um, and then the last one from the 70s is Harder, Faster, I Like to Rock, Say Hello, um, I don't know, 21st century schizoid man. Yeah, so April Wine, probably one of the important hard rock bands out of Canada in the 1970s. And of course, their career continued on into the 80s. And I think they still, after the 80s, they still had a couple more albums after that, like four albums, I think. But anyway, all right, let's move on into the scene where things start to get, you know, really hard. All right, one rippingly cool band. I think it came out of Ontario, Thundermug. Um, their albums were not available for the longest time. They were on Axe Records. And as it turns out, the owner of Axe Records, Greg Hamilton, just a few years ago, he decided to, let's see, 2013, um, he went ahead and re-released this on CD. And then a couple of years after that, their second album, Orbit, and their third album, Tada! And apparently there was a fourth album, which is available too, but I haven't heard it. This first one is really tight. Um, one song, what's it called? Uh, Jane J. James. Jane J. James. Yeah, that is a short, solid, fast, tight, hard rock and monster. The big hit off here was Africa. Not so much hard rock, but really entertaining tune and quite a you know, charging bass line anyway. And a kazoo solo. And they did a cover of You Really Got Me. This is 1972, I think it is, right? Doesn't say. <laughs> it only says 2013. But anyway, yeah, yeah. And uh, the vocals on here are just fantastic. I mean, some of these vocalists coming out of Canada here in the early 70s, they had this really raspy throat, uh, really great hard rock singers. So Thundermug, first album is Strikes. 72, this one I think is, doesn't say of course, this is 2015. Anyway, you're probably 72, 73, 74, or something like that. Um, this album here, they started getting a little bit more experimental um, in a fun way, uh, but you can find good, solid, hard rocking, ripping tracks. There's one song on here called Bad Guy. It's just one of those, just, you know, hit the instruments as hard as you can, play those guitars as hard as you can, and shout as hard as you can. So that's Thundermug. Now, a band I often think is similar to Thundermug, at least in the beginning, is A Foot in Cold Water. 
great name, huh? A Foot in Cold Water. And this is their first album. Now, the first album, this does actually say 1972. This is really my favorite one. It is, again, an early 70s heavy rock, hard rock album. There is, I think, one song on here that has a kind of country rock feel to it, and the rest of it, it's heavy guitars and organ and pretty solid, good rocking album. Now, they had a second album, which I don't have, and then the third album, All Around Us. And what was happening was that they were trying to make it across the border. And so a lot of the songs that were on the first two albums, they re-recorded along with some new material here for the third album. And they had one big hit called Make Me Do Anything You Want, which was later on covered by Helix in the 1980s. And that became like the big ballad hit. And so they tried with some other ballads as well um, and other rock and stuff. They actually started moving a little bit more into progressive territory near the end. Um, but it seemed that in spite of all their struggles, they just really couldn't crack it big time across the border. I don't have the second album. It wasn't available for a while. It is now. But uh, when it wasn't available, I went and got the best of A Foot in Cold Water, which includes songs, of course, from all three albums, plus songs that were coming together for a fourth album, plus some other stuff um, that was also recorded by some of the band members um, as they contemplated the band's future. Uh, basically, they didn't make it uh, through to the end of the 70s. But uh, anyway, their, especially their first album, it is some pretty good, solid, heavy rock, hard rock, a foot in cold water. I have the first three albums of Mahogany Rush. This is Maxum. I don't remember now if it was 71, 72, and it's dedicated to Jimi Hendrix. Um, the main man behind this is Frank Marino, and also, oh, you got the names right here, Paul Harwood, uh, bass, and James Ayob, drums and percussion. This was a three-piece band, and yeah, it's dedicated to Jimi Hendrix because Frank Marino's was a big Jimi Hendrix fan. And what's very interesting is his style of playing and even his style of singing is really similar to Jimi Hendrix. And there's a very funny story about this. Um, when Frank was about 13 years old, I think this was in 68 or so, 69, um, he tried acid and he overdosed and went off into hospital and very serious situation. But anyway, he recovered. And from that, he said, I am not doing drugs again. Forget it. That's way too risky. However, when Mahogany Rush came out and people started hearing their music, they thought that is really like Jimi Hendrix. And then they heard of his story and someone concocted <laughs> the tale that when Frank Marino went into hospital and when he was comatose, that was around the same time that um, Jimi Hendrix had died. And so the soul of Jimi Hendrix entered Frank Marino. And that's why Frank Marino sounds and plays like Jimi Hendrix, which of course is a load of rubbish because Frank had his little trip there a couple of years before Jimi Hendrix died. And he just said that this is the style he feels comfortable playing and that's his way. So, um, but anyway, I like these albums here. I've actually ordered another one. Um, I think it's their fifth album I've ordered. Mahogany Rush, it is very much like as if uh, Jimi Hendrix experience had gone into the 1970s. And so you do have these more kind of, you know, funky, cool tracks, but you've also got these more heavier ones and some really, you know, gritty riffing and so on, but with that kind of smooth style. Um, especially this album here, the third one, Strange Universe, couple of songs on here. Um, Land of a Thousand Nights and Dear Music, love those ones. But uh, yeah, if you've never heard Mahogany Rush, it's you should check them out. I think later on they started to be known as Frank Marino and Mahogany Rush, and then in the end just Frank Marino, but uh, cool stuff. Probably one of the really great Canadian talents that is always just kind of under the radar, like known, but not really known. So I recommend checking Mahogany Rush out. Another really cool band, this is Moxie. And their first album in 1974, the album cover was just so striking that they had to go with a similar design for the second album, <laughs> whatever. And the third album, they finally got a little bit more uh, inventive here. Moxie, um, and this is the first three albums, they actually have a couple of more. They are, again, a really solid, 
hard rock band. I wouldn't call them metal. The second album, yeah, maybe there's a song on here that kind of goes more into metal type territory, but basically they are a solid hard rock band. Now there's an interesting story here on the first album. They went down to California, I think it was, to record this. And um, the producer got in a fight with the guitarist and kicked him out. I said, you are not coming back in the studio. I had enough of you. And then they said, okay, well, we need someone to record the guitar solo parts. Well, it happened that Tommy Bolin, who, of course, was solo and with... Uh, at that time, he was not with Deep Purple yet. Um, he was around in a studio nearby. So they asked, can you come in and do the solo? So as I understand it, all of the guitar solos on this album are played by Tommy Bolin instead. Uh, who was the guy that got kicked? Earl Johnson. That's all right. He was the one who was kicked out. I think it was. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, vocalist Buzz Sherman. He is another one of those really, you know, coarse, uh, buzzing vocal styles. Great hard rock singer. And very sadly, uh, he only recorded three albums with the band before uh, he passed away. And I don't remember why. But anyway, some incident, uh, health incident, actually. So, and then what's interesting is that for the fourth album, they brought in Mike, what's his name now? Mike, Mike Ronio, or Mike Ronioski, I think, I forget, but his name was later on shortened to Mike Reno, when he then was the singer of the band Loverboy in the 1980s. But yeah, one of his um, recording debuts, or anyway, early recordings, is actually the fourth Moxie album, which some people say is just not as good, and they don't like his vocals as much as... Uh, Buzz Sherman's vocals. But anyway, Moxie, a band worth checking out. Personally, I like the first and third album just because the sound is is louder. It's, it's loud, clean, and solid. I find this one here, I don't know, the recording level is just a little bit lower. So even though the songs have kick, it's like there's a cushion in the way. But anyway, cool band to check out. All right, now one of the bands that probably you know about, you just might not have thought about, is Triumph. Okay, now Triumph released three albums in the 1970s. They became quite big in the 1980s, a very solid hard rock band, sometimes going over to the heavy side a little bit, but also the progressive side, which is probably why when they do things more progressive, more complex, a little more technical, and heavy, it also starts to sound a little more like metal than hard rock, but essentially a really solid hard rock act. Now, their debut album in 1976, um, it's a killer album, and one of the things I love about this album is that one of the songs, What's Another Day of Rock and Roll, it starts off with the lines, we've been five years working in a rock and roll band blasting heavy metal all across the land. I mean, 1976, and as far as I know, this must be one of the earliest songs to mention heavy metal as a style of music. Um, I mentioned this previously in another video, but you know, Led Zeppelin mentioned heavy metal in 1975, Trample Underfoot, but they meant the engine under a car hood. Blue Oyster Cult mentioned heavy metal, I think it was in 73 or something, but it was about bombs. And of course, Steppenwolf bought a motorcycle engine in 1968. So as far as I know, this is one of the first songs to actually mention heavy metal as a style of music. Uh, and that's that. And then their second album in 77, Rock and Roll Machine, again, very similar to this. And in fact, when this was released, when Triumph's album was released in the US for the first time, what they did was they picked some songs from here and some from here and put them together. Similar thing that happened with um, actually Thundermug. Uh, they also had the same thing. Their original release in the US was actually a compilation of the first two albums, which is often the case, it seems, for Canadian bands to have that. Anyway, uh, Rock and Roll Machine, the title track, won blistering guitar solo by Rick Emmett. Um, easily a very fantastic guitarist who... Guitarists praise him, but the average person doesn't really recognize him as much, I guess. But anyway, he's he was uh, yeah killer guy uh, on guitar back there in, in those days. And probably still is, too. Anyway, Triumph. I stumbled across this one, um, a band called Wireless. They had, I think, three albums. And the interesting thing was they were actually two Australians who, for some reason, ended up in Ontario. How often does that happen? And they teamed up with two Canadians and formed this band, Wireless. And I think this is their third album. Anyway, uh, second or third album. And 
they were actually produced by Geddy Lee of Rush. This album, and I think one other one, and they were even on the Anthem label, as far as I understand it, um, or Rush's label, Anthem, but they just didn't get as much promotion, uh, probably because Anthem was mostly the driving force of Rush, and um, other bands were on there, but they just, just didn't get focused on enough. Um, yeah, but anyway, Wireless were a kind of hard rock and maybe similar to Max Webster going into Prague a little bit, just maybe a little bit more technical hard rock, but I think more hard rock than Max Webster was. So I thought I'd mention this one here. This is on the Rock Candy label. Um, it's nice because it gives you this uh, booklet inside, lots of explanation about the history of the band. The only thing is that some Rock Candy discs that I have, I am not satisfied with the sound quality. It's a bit scratchy. So this one was actually not so bad. And because it's kind of an obscure album, I, I this is my first Rock Candy purchase. So I thought, oh, it's probably just because it's an obscure band and they didn't have really the best um, originals, you know, whether it was a, a good disc or if it was master tapes. But anyway, um, it's still pretty good though. A couple of songs on here that are really good kick-ass ones that I can kind of let the scratching it's not so bad. There are other ones that are worse. That's actually for another episode. Wireless. Okay, one really weird one is Blue Max. Now this was a band, I think they were from the East Coast somewhere, a trio. They scraped some money together, went to a little recording studio, did their whole recording by themselves. I think it was mid 70s. Printed a limited number of discs and that was basically it. And if you want to know my opinion of this, this sounds like, if you can imagine, a very young version of Rush recording, say, like in 1971 or something, what they might have done before they got to the level of where they were by the time they actually got an album out. So it, it does remind me of like Rush's younger brothers who don't have the experience yet. And I think they were all really young too. They were in their mid-teens or something. So. Um, it's interesting because they are hard rock tracks with, you know, a little bit borderline to heavy metal, but it just sounds really amateur and adolescent, basically. I mean, they're trying March of the Trolls and, uh, I don't know, Prisoner and so on, but eh. The thing is, at the very end, they actually have two modern sounding tracks. I think they got back together and recorded some new ones, and those are actually quite kick-ass, especially the first one, Something on My Mind. Uh, it's really a good heavy hitter, so... That's cool. Anyway, that's Blue Max, limited edition, because it really was. A few more bands to go here. I mentioned this one in my Vancouver episode from spring last year. This is Thor. Um, I think his name is John Micklethor. Anyway, he is from Vancouver. He was originally a bodybuilder, uh, Mr. Universe, Mr. Canada, Mr. US even. Uh, he won many bodybuilding awards before turning to music, but maintaining the bodybuilding. And he had a couple of albums in the 70s, and then 1977, he moved off to New York and recorded this one, Keep the Dogs Away. And what's very interesting is that the sound of this does really have a uh, 1977 New York feel to it. So it's pretty weird. Uh, some songs more on the hard rock side, some songs kind of on this um, not modern style metal, but in around 76, 77, there was this kind of feel for something a little more technical that was not hard rock, but it wasn't what we consider metal by now. It was like a branch that was growing, trying to find its way. And that's how I feel about some of the tracks on here. And there's some, there was a one goofy one called Wasted, which is really a silly one to listen to. Anyway, that's Thor. And Thor would later on go off to um, the UK, and then he'd have some hits there with some proper metal albums in the 1980s and as far as I know the dude is still going and still releasing uh, a new album just last year I think it was. Okay so that's Thor. This is a band called Tease. This is their first album also 1977. Again basically a hard rock album you know distorted guitars, typical hard rock songs. Um, a funny thing is that the very last track uh, Open My Eyes is actually like a Christian ballad and one of the members of the band eventually left the band to pursue being you know, a Christian life. He gave up um, the rock and roll life. So that's like probably one of the oldest Christian ballads I've ever heard. I find it uh, not really all that pleasing to listen to, but the rest of the album is, is a pretty good 
hard rock album from 1977. So that's Tease. And I think they released one or two other albums that were a little bit more of the mm, going for the arena rock or, uh, you know, that more radio friendly style rock. And uh, they went to Japan and actually released a live album in Japan as well. This is their debut from 1977, Tease. I'm going to mention Pat Travers. He's not really heavy metal, but he's listed in Wikipedia as having covered hard rock anyway. And basically this is his second album here. One of two albums in 1977. The first one was 76. This is called Makin' Magic. Some of the songs on here are pretty solid hard rocking songs. And then some of them are a little bit more like the blues rock or country rock or Jimi Hendrix inspired rock. So. Pat Travers, I wouldn't really call them heavy metal, but this album here is a pretty solid one. The only gripe I have about it is that this is what, the 2014 or 2004? I don't know. Anyway, it was a re-release and the sound on here is again pumped way too high. So it's, it's scratchy. And even though the music on this album is brilliant, the sound quality is terrible. If you look it up on amazon.com, you'll see some people giving it one star because of the sound quality and another person giving it three stars but complaining about the sound quality so it's really too bad um i think it sounds like a great album but what can you do okay one more band to mention for the 1970s hard rock in canada they had three albums the first one forget it way too hard to find i was very lucky to get a hold of this one this is Gotto. um who cares second album if indeed it is lonely at the top, who cares? It's lonely at the bottom too. Okay, now that's their second album. This is their third album, An Act of Godot. Godot was a band formed by Greg Godovitz, and um, he was originally, he did something with Buzz Sherman of Moxie and something. I forget the name of the band though, but uh, anyway, basically Godot's first band, a uh, first album was in 1977, I think and then 78, 79. Um, this one here is brilliant. And it's really cool because it has this hard rock with a kind of sleazy side to it, but sometimes kind of like, like rubbing shoulders with punk rock. Um, it's just interesting. And uh, I think it's a unique album too. Um, one song, Oh Carol, Kiss My Whip, uh, starts off with some, you know, sassy punk rock band person saying uh, to Carol Pope of the band Rough Trade, you know, uh, Carol, you cannot, you know, uh, kiss my whip, baby, <laughs> like this. I don't know. But uh, Tough Times, Cock On, and Too Much Carousing, absolutely brilliant. This one here still has the hard rock sound, not as crunchy as this one, but also mm, a little bit more experimental in some ways. So... A lot of people say not as good as this one here, but I was very lucky to get both of these because when I can't find uh, a band and I really want to get a hold of their stuff, I try to find out who their label is and can I contact the label. And <laughs> I contacted the label for, for Gatto and I asked the guy there and he said, I, I don't, um, Gatto, they are looking after themselves now. I don't have any rights to their music, so I can't. Uh, reissue any of the albums and then a couple of weeks later he sent me a message he said I was cleaning up in the office and I happened to find one wrapped copy of who cares so I'll give it to you for 20 bucks shipping included oh yes please <laughs> and then about a month or so later I happened to find <laughs> this one and another one from the late 80s so again I'll give it to you for 20 boxes I'll take it but not the later one I was interested more in the 70s Canadian hard rock stuff so I really was happy to get a hold of those two I'd love to get the debut if I could but it's uh, gonna be costly anyway that then is what I have of Canadian hard rock from the 1970s one band I don't have is called Wanka I just found about them recently Wanka, The Orange Album. It is another one of those unique albums. It's hard rock, going a little bit proggy sometimes, and then a little bit bizarre, maybe almost like a Canadian humor style sometimes. <laughs> anyway, and I saw that they were on the Axe Records label, same as uh, Thundermug, and so I did actually shoot an uh, email off to Greg Hamilton and ask, hey, how about Wanka? Any chance of them being re released? And he said, I don't have the rights to that anymore. Sorry. So uh, might just be one of those things you can only find on YouTube. Check out Wanka on YouTube. Okay. 
If anybody watching this knows of some other hard rock acts from Canada from the 1970s that I will hopefully be able to get on CD, please leave a comment. Otherwise, thanks for watching. And I'm telling you, in the next part, we're going to move on to hard rock and heavy metal in Canada from the 1980s. And I have a book, too. So stay tuned for that. That's all for today. And I got to tell you one thing, one thing. So I didn't feature any music on this program. Um, that's fine. But... I actually put together one of those videos where you have like 10 second samples or so 10, 15 second samples of different groups, songs. And so I'm going to put here, ding. Okay. Go to that link and you can just get these little short clips of various hard rock acts from Canada in the 1970s. Okay. Thanks for watching. <laughs> See you in the next episode. All right. Bye.